Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our very first uh, uh, webinar on ship recycling. Uh, you know, the reason we decided to speak a little bit about this is because the last uh, few months has been uh, has seen unprecedented changes in our planet. Uh, humanity has changed. Things have happened in a way that has never happened before. Uh, this has happened uh, in across uh, countries. It was not something sudden that we faced in 2008, and almost overnight, the, the financial uh, conditions changed in this world. This was more gradual, starting from January and February and March, uh, but suddenly, once the world realized we have a pandemic in place, uh, there were some uh, great challenges ahead for all of us. Uh, shipping being a truly global uh, business entity, uh, was in the forefront of this. Uh, ship owners and their ships and the crew at various ports uh, faced most of these uh, challenges heads on, head, uh, head on. Uh, for those of us in the ship recycling business, we had our own sets uh, of challenges. As you can uh, figure it out that we are talking buying ships on as is basis or on delivered basis. Uh, ships that were already purchased either on as is basis or in various uh, or on delivered basis had their own sets of challenges. Uh, we could not fly crew to places and uh, to various ports and take over the vessels. Uh, ships that are coming on delivered basis, they could not be delivered in time. Uh, the good news in all that, if there is a good news, was that there was uh, really true cooperation between uh, the ship owners, ship brokers, the cash buyers, and the yards and all of us put our minds together how to find solutions uh, to, the, to this big problem. Uh, so what we decided to do is just talk more uh, today for the next 45 minutes on a more uh, uh, macro stage over the challenges that we faced, how we resolve those problems, how do we see the situation today, and how do we move forward. So this is going to be uh, a little bit broader uh, discussion items. And as we go, and based on how the audience response will take Q&A at the later part uh, of the session, once the speakers are done, and I'll try to moderate the session. My name is uh, Anil Sharma, and I'm the founder of GMS. Uh, I have a very esteemed panel of traders. Uh, some of you have asked why we didn't invite external people. We will, as these webinars get popular. We thought that the issues, uh, the examples we had and the situations we went through were so diverse that we had enough uh, wealth of experience within the, the GMS team to talk about, uh, do some of these case studies and how we resolved and what our suggestions are on how we can make this operation go even, even better. So what we have is, is, is three traders, and I'm gonna start with the introduction of Fedon. Fedon is, uh, one of our youngest traders, but not in term, maybe youngest in terms of age, but not in terms of experience. Uh, he's a naval architect. Uh, he's also a marine engineer, a graduate of CAS Business School. He has been with GMS now for um, uh, more than three years. He has done some extremely creative work and unique work, uh, including setting up some of the most creative deals uh, under his, uh, how do you say, ownership. We did our very first, for example, decommissioning project of an offshore uh, unit, going to the field and, and uh, decommissioning the unit, uh, bringing her to a port, cleaning her up fully, and then taking it uh, to the ship recycling yard. Uh, the reason I say this is because normally the view in this industry is that cash buyers are simply uh, intermediaries used by ship owners uh, to beat regulatory uh, situations. And I'm trying to say that's not what we do. Uh, we add far greater value uh, to a project, to a deal, than simply coming in and reflagging the vessel and taking to a ship recycling yard. Uh, the other panel members we have is Vagelis. Vagelis has been uh, much longer with us, uh, and he has uh, done some of the most creative deals as well, including he has been the trader of the year at GMS, and he has done several offshore projects uh, several green projects, several trading projects, of course, with the recycling being uh, our, our core business. 
Uh, and last but not the least, uh, we will have Jimmy Dalzell. Uh, by the way, Vagelis is, is, is in our uh, Greece office. Fedon works out of a Dubai office. Currently, he's uh, under quarantine in Greece. Not a bad place to be in quarantine, but not because he's caught with something, but just because he's down there while we face these challenges. And Jamie, our uh, most senior trader, has been with us for more than 10 years. He has worked in offices in US and Dubai and in China and now in Singapore. Uh, has done more than 500 deals. And uh, of all the traders, he had several vessels that were stuck uh, during this uh, COVID-19 situation. And he'll bring up the rare of this uh, discussions. Um, so without further delay, I'm going to take uh, hand over the floor to Fedon to talk about his experiences on COVID-19. Fedon, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Sharma. Uh, good afternoon to everyone from my side as well. My name is Fedon Panagiotopoulos, a trader in Dubai office and uh, currently uh, residing in Greece. Um, starting on the COVID-19 issue, it's important to note what happened pre-COVID-19. A pre COVID 19, I think we had uh, experienced one very robust and uh, very healthy recycling market. Uh, obviously, uh, we had a couple of years in the 400s, uh, but definitely we didn't face anything like uh, the situation that we faced during the COVID 19 issue. So, definitely, it was an unprecedented situation that we had to face, and obviously, with a good cooperation of uh, uh, the cash buyers together with the sellers, and obviously, the end buyers being the recycling yards, the situation to the biggest extent was almost handled. So to that, I would like to begin with uh, what has happened during uh, the COVID-19. And I would like to start with a timeline of what happened in the local recycling markets uh, in the subcontinent, this being obviously uh, Alang in India, uh, Gadan in Pakistan, and Sitagong in Bangladesh. Um, COVID-19 obviously started in Wuhan province uh, around December 2019 but uh, obviously it didn't become a huge issue till January, February. At that time, obviously, the markets did not really react to this. Coming March, though, we faced uh, a cascading effect in all three markets. Starting on 17th of March 2020, as you can see in the slide, Pakistan imposed a ban on beaching operations of vessels. So practically every vessel that was already in Pakistan or was about to call Pakistan for recycling could not pretty much be beached. Moving forward, 19th of March, India is reacting to the virus as well. Vessels are not allowed to call along with foreign crew. Obviously, Indian crew was still an option for the next couple of uh, days, but definitely this created some big issues, especially on vessels being delivered with foreign crew. Pakistan on 22nd of uh, March suspends all flights. One day later, Bangladesh also joins the game with uh, the Ministry of Industries officially not issuing no objection certificate for importing vessels in Bangladesh. So immediately, uh, the recycling market in Bangladesh was in a standstill. 24th, which is a highlighted date, is uh, the day that India goes into a complete lockdown. All flights are suspended. And obviously, no business activities, no banking taking place. Everything is suspended indefinite as of that date. Between 24th and 26th of March, Bangladesh suspends all flights as well. 24 starting with the domestic flights and up to 26 all the international flights are suspended as well. And from 26, obviously, the total lockdown is imposed in, the, in Bangladesh. And obviously in Sitagong as well, which is the main recycling hub. Moving on to April 2020, on 7th, officially the recycling activities stop in Bangladesh. Well, stating recycling activities, we don't, mean, we don't want to talk about the beaching of the vessels, but mainly about the cutting activities of the yards and the decommissioning of the vessels. Obviously, one week later, uh, after coming out of this uh, uh, holiday season, as it was uh, pronounced by the government of Bangladesh, the yards resume some activity in Bangladesh, but on subjects. These subjects we will see also developing in other countries as well, in Pakistan and in India, for resuming the recycling activities, mainly referred to sanitation, of the site, mainly uh, on keeping and maintaining the social distance between distancing between uh, the yard workers, obviously PPE, COVID testing, and everything. But uh, just with an asterisk there, the fact that the yards were not operating on full capacity, meaning you didn't have 100% of the labor that normally yards operates on joining the yard for the actual second activities, which obviously, as Vagelis will talk later, had an impact on demand and slow production. 
On 21st of April, the yard activities resume in Alang, India, subject obviously to the same uh, conditions, social distancing and sanitation, etc. One week later, the beaching operations resume in Alang, subject though to all the vessels arriving month and at their own power, having only Indian crew. So you have also a major subject there that prevented many of the deliveries. By the end of April, around 28th, Pakistan officially lifts the ban on the beaching operations as well and starts to see some activity as well. Moving forward on May 2020, on 3rd of May, you have the first NOC for importing vessel for recycling in Bangladesh. So the ministry, the government is giving a push in order to open, reopen the industry there. On 6th, you have the first vessel beaching in Pakistan. And then moving forward on 11th, the first beaching operation of a vessel in Bangladesh. Between the 3rd, that the first NOC was obtained, to the 11th, obviously, there were uh, many restrictions that not allow boarding parties going on board the vessel at Anchorage uh, to complete the formalities. So, so that's why we had some time lag there. On 12th, India resumed steel plate trading. So this is something important that we have to take note of, that the first beaching operation in India, subject, of course, to Indian crew, is taking place on 28th April, but steel plate trading resumes on 12th May. So you have approximately two, two weeks there that uh, the yards are buying, but the steel plates are not trading, so they cannot sell the material. Having said that, and uh, moving down memory lane, we want to see also what's the current status in these uh, recycling markets. And pretty much across the board, uh, you will see the same situation. Going to India, there is a mandatory 14-day quarantine period for vessels calling along. But the catch here is that this includes also the voyage time. So actually, this is 14 days that the vessel has to pretty much uh, call along and stay there, either idle or include the voyage time. So meaning if a vessel is in Fujairah, which is probably make maybe four or five days to along, the devil is has to stay there idle for the rest nine day period prior to any boarding take place. In India, currently, you have only limited domestic flights available up until today. International flights are very, very difficult. Actually, they are not taking place. And this, obviously, with many of cash buyers on Nazis deliveries using local Indian crew, this has also created a big issue on bringing the crew to the delivery location for taking over the vessel. The third thing, the third thing that we have to note about India is the scarcity of labor in the steel industry and projects. Obviously, we are talking about 25 to 30 percent uh, workforce in all the projects across the board, which means lower uh, production. And uh, obviously, this means a decreased demand. By 15th of August, we expect that this uh, number will, this percentage will increase to around 50 percent. So we will expect some demand there. Um, moving forward to Pakistan, you have the same 14-day quarantine period since last port of call in order to allow boardings. You have obviously in India as well, but in Pakistan and Bangladesh, you have mandatory COVID testing to the boarding party that goes on board the vessel, as well as to the crew members post beaching. In case any crew member is found positive uh, to COVID-19, then uh, this uh, crew member will be uh, quarantined for a period of, till obviously the disease is passed and then he will be able to be repatriated uh, to the place that he resides. Domestic flights in Pakistan have resumed, and there is mandatory testing for international flights, mainly Emirates, Etihad, and other major airlines, but this mandatory testing has to be done on registered labs. In Bangladesh, you have obviously the same 14-day uh, quarantine period since the last port of call. Same thing here, you have a medical team going on board together with the boarding party to check the crew health and condition, and obviously subject to the findings, uh, crew members will be quarantined or not. The important thing to note in all three locations is that now the delays are being minimized, meaning that if somebody tests positive for COVID-19, this will not delay the beaching operation, but rather be treated separately post beaching. Domestic flights in Bangladesh have resumed 1st of June 2020, and several international flights are also open since 15th of June. There are some restrictions in some countries, uh, but definitely uh, the, there are solutions there. Moving forward to the next slide. Um, on this slide, we want to actually explain what were the issues, uh, what are the issues that we are currently facing. Obviously, this does not correlate to what we faced during the actual uh, outbreak of COVID-19 and the total lockdown of all markets, because uh, let me put it as simply as that, the markets were completely standstill. There was no activity. Uh, in 2008, when the big financial crisis hit the market, obviously 
the markets were suffering, but this was a complete standstill. Nothing was happening, no business activities at all. Um, but what, we are what are we facing today? Today, obviously, as uh, uh, the majority of our audience may know, cash buyers are taking delivery either on as-is basis, meaning all over the world, wherever the port that the sellers want to sell their vessel, the owners want to sell their vessel, uh, which means that obviously the cash buyers will have to fly their crew and uh, do the complete takeover operation and bring the vessel from A to B, B being obviously the recycling destination of the vessel. Or on delivered basis, which means that owners will bring the vessel themselves to either one of the recycling destinations. On as-is basis, the current issues that we are facing, obviously, number one, becomes the visa issue. Taking, for example, uh, UAE, that is a place that uh, I work out of, uh, in UA, you had uh, since I think mid March, you had the uh, complete uh, lockdown on complete lockdown, and also you had also the visa uh, system being down. So no visas are being issued currently. Uh, if you if uh, anybody had read uh, has read the Lloyd's list uh, front page, you will see that Dubai slowly starts uh, allowing visas for crew and crew chains. But the visa is issue still persists in many countries, meaning that the cash buyer cannot bring his crew in these countries in order to take over. Obviously, you have flight unavailability. Flight unavailability in order to bring the crew, especially from India currently, which you have only domestic flights being operating. And uh, the third thing is obviously the scarcity of local crew. Sometimes uh, cash bars have tried uh, in view of the lack of crew coming out of India or subcontinent or Philippines or other uh, major crew providing countries. They try to find local crew and uh, the issue becomes that local crew cannot be provided in the sense that they are not sure that the crew providers and the managers and the crewing agencies if this crew can be repatriated eventually due to this uh, visa issue and everything. Moving on the delivered issues, delivered deal issues, uh, the first being the repatriation issues for existing crew. You have delays, you have uh, people that may be uh, testing positive for COVID and uh, this also will uh, lead to running up escalation because the crew wages will be covered, the insurances will be still there. Another thing that we have to note that we, have, that we are facing currently are delays on the banking fronts. Obviously, the banks, uh, after facing the big crisis the first uh, couple of weeks of uh, trying to handle the liquidity, the existing liquidity, and now they're working still remotely, the majority of them, which means that you're gonna have delays on opening LCs, on releasing LCs, and uh, obviously the whole deal to be completed. Last but not least, there are the issues of renegotiations. Uh, during this uh, COVID-19 era, you had the force majeure clauses being invoked, and pretty much this resulted to the price being negotiated by the end buyer to the seller down the stream. Having Facing these issues currently, we are trying to see how we would uh, face this issue, how we can provide solution providers, because keeping in mind that uh, our role as cash buyers in this industry is to be the solution provider to the sellers as well as to the end buyers. The first thing that uh, immediately we came upon is the undertow delivery. Undertow delivery, meaning a tug will come, will hook up to the vessel and will bring the vessel all the way to the recycling destination. This means that obviously the tow will be unmanned majority of the situations apart from some specific offshore units obviously so you're not going to have any facing any crew issues another issue that we have uh, another solution that we have uh, experienced ourselves and we have uh, already done is to take over with sellers crew sellers crew upon uh, an agreement between sellers and the cash buyer owners and the cash buyer can remain on board obviously on uh, cash buyers uh, risk and expense and bring the vessel all the way to the recycling destination a third solution would be to charter flights in order to bring crew out of India and into the specific uh, locations where the takeover will take place, this being all around the globe. post beaching assistance can be provided, and uh, to that extent I would like to share a personal experience. Um, in Bangladesh, uh, you had the issue that uh, when the crew disembarks a vessel, they get a three-day visa. And because of this three-day visa and the flight unavailability at that time, it was not able the crew were not able to disembark the vessel and at that point they had to stay on board the vessel. So many owners uh, came to us asking the same question. How can I get my crew out of the vessel into a hotel uh, that they're going to at least stay there and be you know, taken care of? So moving forward uh, in India, where we delivered the vessel uh, recently, 
we made all the necessary arrangements in order to bring the crew out of the vessel despite any issues with interstate uh, travel and place them in a hotel in a good western type hotel and stay there till they can get repatriated so it's very important what i'm trying to say is that it's very important to have the sellers the owners and the cash buyers together with the local agents working together in harmony in order to face the issue because solutions are there in some cases we have seen also um, the sellers themselves doing some crew change prior arrival to the recycling destination in ports that were allowed in india sellers brought the vessels did some crew change there in order to bring the vessel with indian crew so this is another solution that we have identified obviously when you when as an owner you are facing issues and uh, renegotiations you want to ensure that whatever happens uh, the buyer will perform this is the biggest issue of all sellers and of all owners so to that extent it's very important to navigate these uncharted waters with the help of a good performing cash buyer a cash buyer that will stand by the contract and will not only stay to the contract but go over and above in order to assist the owner so the performance of cash buyer is this is not only uh, on the funds on the price let me put it that way but it's also on the assistance that you can give locally so that's how we define the performance moving forward and uh, going to a broader perspective it is very important to know that uh, probably there's not going to be a time in this lifetime uh, that we will have to test the force majeure clause uh, more heavily the force majeure clause that was uh, treated as let's say a standard clause in a contract in nsf or a demo contract now it's being uh, mandatory what we believe here in gms is that the force majeure clause protects both sellers as well as buyers and it has it has to be paramount uh, important part of the nsf or the demo contract the reason being and i can give an example that uh, obviously force majeure uh, uh, clauses were invoked by the end buyers as well as well as the cash buyers and to some extent by the sellers as well but i can give a very good example of an owner that during a, a very let's say depressed uh, dry market sold his vessel for recycling and then due to this force majeure clause was able to cancel the contract come out of the recycling destination and trade his vessel and obviously everybody knows what's the condition today of the dry market is not probably at its peak but it's definitely better than what used to be q1 so for in our perspective in our uh, perspective it's very very important to have a good solid force majeure clause that uh, pretty much covers both the place of delivery if it's an as is or on delivery basis what's happening in the recycling destination having said all the above i have to extend my gratitude to all my clients obviously talking about the owners of the vessels and the buyers who are assisting to a great extent to get the deal through uh, and uh, I want to state on behalf of GMS that if you don't have this vital link of cooperation between owners, cash buyers and end buyers, you will not be able to find the solution. We had obviously the vast majority of owners working together with cash buyers and solutions were found. That being said, I think that uh, I've covered the issues of what happened in the local recycling markets, but my colleague uh, and uh, fellow co-trader, Mr. Vangelis Hadzigiannis of uh, GMS Elas, will be able to go more into supply and demand fundamentals and advise what were the prices. Thank you, Fedon. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity and thank uh, all our clients, ship owners, brokers, ship recyclers, associated agents basically who have uh, truly made uh, uh, this pandemic uh, of course not seem like a walk in the park but uh, it evidenced at least uh, from my experience the first time a remarkable example that if we can all work together uh, solutions can be found um, and overcome difficult situations um, following up with the presentation of uh, Fedon, I'm, as he said also, I'm going to be touching uh, mostly on the commercial uh, aspects and effects of uh, the COVID-19 and basically try to understand how this affected the supply demand, the pricing, the currencies, uh, the steel uh, prices and commodities themselves and uh, most importantly to understand where we were before this uh, COVID uh, um, pandemic taking place and where we are starting today. And that's why I'm starting with a slide where you can see that uh, I'm referring to the price fluctuations since one year ago, July 2019, uh, when we were in a substantial different market with uh, prices for recycling and residual values being excess 
four hundred dollars per ton in all the markets and then as we are getting uh, closer i mean you can see the monsoon effect where traditionally uh, there is a market correction during uh, the timing of uh, the monsoon period uh, meaning july august and then evidencing a small uh, correction while we're coming closer to q3 and q4 of uh, the year now uh, at uh, the beginning of this year, you can see that uh, the prices uh, were again improving and uh, that uh, this improvement on the prices basically halted uh, for in, uh, during uh, March when is the timeline when the, all the countries as Fedon highlighted, um, the lockdowns started taking place. We saw the, a substantial drop at the beginning. Nobody was offering, uh, at least from uh, recyclers. Uh, and uh, whereas there was a gap of nearly 5% between each country on the prices, then what we witnessed was that basically no recycling yard was able to offer or do something about uh, the successful delivery of the vessel. Uh, irrespective of that, uh, what I'm reflecting in uh, the slide that is being presented is that there were still quoted prices, which I think is uh, basically reflecting what positions gas buyers were uh, really taking on during uh, the purchases, either this was on uh, assist basis or on forward delivered basis. And uh, thankfully, after uh, this uh, quarantine period was over and markets uh, basically started reopening, uh, we saw the markets um, evidencing that there was uh, demand coming back across the board from all three countries uh, but at this time um, uh, the role of each country was changing a bit uh, because of the um, uh, reasons that are affecting the supply demand and uh, from the yard and the pricing accordingly so pakistan for example from where it was uh, the last of the third of the three leading uh, countries uh, in the indian subcontinent have recently surged as the most aggressive one currently right now whereas on the other hand if we go all the way up to mediterranean we can see that uh, basically uh, there was a similar effect on the pricing there as well and has affected the market but uh, it's following more or less the same trend as it does in the indian subcontinent markets so uh, if i want to look into this a little bit more in detail i'm going to start with a, i'm going to continue with my next slide where basically uh, you can see the um, uh, report uh, on each country i'm starting with india uh, because this is uh, one of uh, the countries that is offering the biggest capacity with nearly four and a half million lightweight being there and uh, as it is evidenced also on the graphs that uh, are being presented basically you can uh, see that uh, uh, on, the, on the currency at least at the same time as last year the indian rupee was trading to about 68 units to the dollar whereas after um, march uh, when we started seeing the implications of uh, coronavirus basically it has uh, gone up to 76 indicating uh, a significant depreciation in the currency there uh, this goes without saying that uh, it uh, has a uh, direct effect also on the steel prices being offered. So on the graph below, what I'm evidencing is um, the steel prices translated in US dollars. So you can see that basically it's um, uh, reversible to uh, how the, the currency of India is going with prices correcting from a similar period from four, excess $400 per ton uh, to a point where it was even uh, slightly above 300 and just showing uh, uh, signs of correction, positive correction recently. Uh, now, if we have to look at uh, the activity that has taken place throughout the year so far, I mean, evidently India has been a very active uh, market there, which has absorbed excess 500, 100 vessels so far this year, or excess 1 million lightweight there, uh, through the yards that are operating. Uh, but what I would like uh, to take out of this uh, slide is basically uh, the effect on the currency and the steel prices, which if I go to my next slide to see uh, what was the similar trend in the Pakistani market there, it's um, we can see we have some observation and to make uh, comparing the two of them so for example the pakistani rupee similarly faced a big depreciation in the currency uh, and uh, similarly on the steel prices as well of course uh, the um, the variation was not as much as as big as in india uh, and somebody would anticipate that uh, pakistan should be basically lower in prices comparing to the indian market 
Uh, but what is important to note here is that there are other factors where it, which are affecting the demand and the pricing uh, that we see. For example, in my first slide, I showed that the, the pricing in Pakistan is becoming more aggressive. And by somebody noting this um, depreciation in the currency in combination with the steel, uh, could probably assume that it should be following the same trend. But there are factors which are always um, uh, affecting the decision making of recycling yards and what we understand right now is that exactly because of this uh, depreciation in the currency a lot of recycling facilities are using this as a hedging tool in order to uh, insulate themselves from the risk of uh, further depreciation of uh, the currency uh, whereas it is important to note that with, this, with all these uh, trade restrictions which have been imposed in view of coronavirus, for example, Pakistan is now any longer able to import uh, scrap steel and so on from countries like uh, were traditionally exporting to Pakistan like UAE and so on. Uh, the, but uh, yeah, so far this year, they have, uh, Pakistan has recycled only 200,000 lightweight, which is a small figure comparing to what we saw uh, in the Indian market, which is about five times more. But it's important to highlight that uh, Pakistan was almost inactive last year uh, with uh, slightly more than half of the lightweight that has been already recycled so far in 2020. So uh, for us, it's a sign that Pakistan is coming back. We see recyclers are having appetite and uh, probably from what you've seen in market reports, basically it's the market that is absorbing the torrents that is currently in the market uh, with uh, the high prices comparing to the rest to recycled markets that we have seen. Uh, and uh, if you are wondering what is happening with Bangladesh, uh, where uh, Bangladesh is uh, another nice example that we can see with my next slide, um, where basically if I have uh, to highlight the, the uh, currency and the steel price situation is again uh, different from the other two countries. So in Bangladesh we can see a very stable currency uh, throughout uh, the year so far, irrespective of the corona virus uh, effect that this has in the markets, uh, which we think that is uh, uh, attributed basically to the other means uh, that supporting the national economy there, like the exports of textiles, uh, the uh, foreign reserves of the country being basically uh, dependent mostly on uh, its expats and uh, the funds that are uh, becoming in the country through them. Um, on the other hand, the steel prices, so uh, we can see a slight correction there. Um, to an extent, uh, basically between the uh, pre-corona period and after the coronavirus period, basically you can see the prices also have corrected from above uh, $400 per ton to uh, basically slightly below that, uh, which is might be able to be explained through the lightweight and the number of vessels that have been absorbed from Bangladesh until that time. Uh, because um, if uh, somebody was monitoring the market at that time, basically Bangladesh was the market that was absorbing pretty much all the large uh, tonnage that was applied in the market. And it was the market that basically most of the vessels were stuck uh, during uh, the coronavirus period. Uh, excess 1 million lightweight there has been recycled so far this year, similar with uh, India, despite the lower capacity of uh, the country there. And uh, evidently, Bangladesh has had been leading the uh, recycling industry at least on the first quarter of this year. Um, now, um, I think it's interesting to look at the total volumes that have been recycled, and that's why with this graph, what I'm showing here is basically throughout the years since 2012, uh, the supply uh, of tonnets, uh, the, the tonnets that has been recycled, basically. Uh, you can see that 2012 was the busiest year by far, and um, in fact, is in, um, it is the highest uh, year ever um, recorded uh, for recycling so much volume with, ex with excess 60 million uh, dead weight being recycled. Uh, coming to uh, the present in 2020, we have uh, nearly 14 million dead weight being recycled and we are pretty confident uh, that it's going to surpass the figures of 2019 uh, and uh, we're wondering if we're going to see as busy times as in 2016 and 17 which I guess it's early to predict, but um, it's going to depend mostly on the freight markets, uh, which uh, have a detrimental effect on the donors that are being supplied.
if we come to think of it, uh, basically uh, we have seen this year dry units being supplied, especially CAPES and PLOCs. Uh, we have seen um, containers in the meantime during the coronavirus period, but uh, smaller lightweight. And uh, with my next slide, uh, I'm going to be highlighting basically what is going to be the, um, uh, how this tonnage is being distributed amongst the countries. So in the in your left uh, hand side, you can see um, the categories uh, of the main categories of vessels. I have put in their bulk carriers, containers, and tankers mostly, whereas other units like uh, from the offshore segment, either there are rigs or uh, uh, tags or fishing boats or any other type, basically is being put together on the others. So on the bulk carrier, it's evident that. Uh, uh, the total volumes that have been recycled are by far the most comparing to uh, the rest of the categories, except 700,000 lightweight, nearly 800,000 lightweight of bulk areas has been recycled. And evidently, Bangladesh has dominated uh, um, in absorbing the market by absorbing this, um, this tonnage. Uh, with uh, nearly 550,000 uh, lightweight having been uh, recycled in Bangladesh alone of bulk carriers. Um, second comes the, the, uh, in terms of supply. Uh, from what you can see there, it's coming as tankers. I have to highlight here that we are not, uh, in my figures, it's not included pure tanker units. It's included also FPSOs and LNG carriers and LPGs. So I have categorized this um, uh, in there. Uh, that's why you see that they are slightly surpassing the total figures of containers being recycled, uh, which uh, their figures are really not significant with success, 300,000 uh, 300, lightweight being recycled so far this year. Uh, so because the bulk areas have been uh, the type of vessels that have dominated the supply so far this year, um, have created uh, the graph that you can see on your right-hand side, I think what's interesting to see is that basically uh, the VLOCs and the CAPES are contributing to a, a significant proportion of the bulk areas that have been recycled, uh, whereas uh, what you can see as yellow in the, the pipe that is being presenting is other sizes, like from uh, small handies up to mini CAPES and so on. Uh, so CAPES and VLOCs, although being uh, relatively small in number, they're dominating in terms of uh, light with uh, being uh, provided for the recycling facilities so far this year. Uh, now, uh, going ahead to the next slide, I think it's interesting to see uh, how was the pre-COVID-19 basically supply of tonnage and how it looks today. And in particular, on the uh, upper part of the presentation, uh, it's interesting to note that basically Bangladesh has uh, was before the COVID period was absorbing most of the tonnage, with uh, coming first in place, with uh, nearly uh, 50 units have been being recycled just until uh, March of uh, 2020. Uh, whereas, if I have to uh, skip this uh, uh, COVID time and come to the present, basically you will see that India is overtake, has overtaken Bangladesh, and basically right now uh, they have recycled nearly 104 units, uh, comparing to Bangladesh being uh, back to 79 in the second position, and Pakistan quickly catching up with uh, 26 units having been delivered and, and in the process of being recycled, basically. Um, and I think that's about it from my side, if I have to focus on, the, on these factors. And I thank you all very much for your attention. Now, um, I think it's, it would be good to see if we can uh, hear from my colleague Jamie Delzel, who is based out of Singapore, uh, his experiences and, uh, during these difficult times. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Few technical pro problems there with the camera, but um, we're back. Yeah. So, I mean, just to sort of follow up on uh, what my colleagues have said, um, I'm going to kind of give a few real life uh, examples and, uh, you know, some of the experiences I've had during this COVID crisis. Um, firstly, I should say that, you know, being here in the Far East, uh, we saw the early stages of COVID-19 emerging from China, but all of the early information All of the early information seemed to suggest that they had it under control. So 
um, you know, with the memories of SARS and MERS out here still fresh in their minds, the immediate track and trace uh, use of masks um, helped to curb any immediate spread. However, I don't think anybody really expected just how contagious or far-reaching the pandemic would become, and the weak responses of Europe and the US in particular shows just how unprepared we all were. Coming to shipping in particular, being cash buyers who take over 200 ships for recycling every year, 50% of these on an as-is basis, we are amongst the most exposed in the maritime sector. Um, so if we could go back to maybe slide four of, of Fidon's presentation, because uh, there are a couple of points I'll pick up on there. Um, on Aziz deliveries, I, I'd actually taken one Panamax container in Kaohsiung immediately before lockdown started to be imposed across the globe. Uh, on the way over to India, Mr. Modi imposed what became the largest uh, countrywide lockdown known to man for a period of two months. So we ended up stopping this ship in Colombo to wait for the market in India to reopen because the ship could only go to India. Um, whilst we stopped there, we witnessed the market falling by over $100 per lightweight. Uh, and on a 22,000 lightweight Panamax container, a loss of over $100 is coming to almost $2.5 million, including the waiting time we had to spend there. So the asset itself had depreciated by uh, around 30%. Um, and, you know, when, when cash buyers are often forced to fight for less than 1% uh, on these deals, <laughs> these are huge risks. Um, you know, we wonder uh, whether we can even make up uh, this, this uh, you know, $2.5 million loss from these owners uh, in future. Um, you know, this, we actually had some chartering possibilities uh, come to us during this period of time we were in Colombo. So, you know, in order to mitigate some of these losses. but. Um, uh, you know, after discussing with the owners, we um, we didn't take that up, and, and we even had a chance to sell for a lot higher into competing markets like um, uh, uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan. But since this is an only HKC sale, um, we had to follow the, the contract strictly, and we sold it into India eventually when the markets reopened at, at, at this huge loss, as I've said. Um, I had some other owners uh, when the lockdown came in. We had one of their ASIS vessels, uh, and they decided to, to do a few more voyages whilst uh, crew, crew exchange uh, w was not certain. We couldn't get crew out from India, they couldn't take crew off. Um, so they did a few more voyages uh, to, to mitigate some of their losses. And obviously when they came back, the market was a lot lower, but those are the new commercial realities. Um, I, I also had some vessels on a delivered basis, which, which were problematic. Um, I had a similar size Cape size bulker from a major owner that um, was on the way over to India when the market shut. Um, they too had to stop the vessel in Colombo and wait for markets to reopen. Um, and of course, by the time the markets had reopened, uh, they'd missed their cancelling date uh, and a new commercial deal had to be agreed well over $100 per lightweight again. So, you know, a, a $2 million loss uh, on, that, on that asset. Um, not a nice discount to take in any market, but, you know, these are the new commercial realities. And, and you know, grateful that, that the owners were so understanding and, and uh, cooperative uh, in order to sort of... Uh, come to the table and, and accept it. Um, I had another delivered deal that, you know, it, during this COVID crisis that, that became quite interesting in that I had a vessel that was delivering to India and um, it hadn't called any port for 14 days uh, and it had been at sea on the way over to Alang. And after beaching the vessel, the master actually tested positive for COVID-19. No other crew members, just the master. And it still remains a mystery um, how it, you know, he he became COVID positive, uh, but after following quite a few, you know, all the local protocols and uh, putting the crew and the uh, and the master into into a quarantine facility in in a hotel, uh, we we along with good cooperation from the buyers, we fully disinfected the vessel. And uh, you know, this 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 kind of case, I'm afraid, is is going to happen uh, time and again. We've heard other cases with cash buyers of of different vessels where uh, crew members, masters. Um, agents even have, have tested positive. So uh, it, it's a kind of new reality that, that, that we're, we're living in. Um, just to come on to something a little bit different, you know, markets have since reopened. Uh, we've had a couple of Hong Kong takeovers that we've, uh, we've, we've had to do this week um, because Hong Kong has been a port that has been clear for, for takeovers for, for a little bit of time. So we took two larger containers this week. We've got two more next week. Um, 
uh, and you know that the protocol and the procedures are, are far tougher and far more complicated than they've ever been. You know there are no international flights coming out from India, so we've had to charter a flight from India to get the crew out. Um, again, not easy. And prior departure, the crew have to go through a full COVID test. And upon arrival to the airport, they have to go through a full COVID test. And, and this is becoming the new normal. And, and it's becoming increasingly difficult because now we've seen uh, a, a spike in cases in Hong Kong. So, you know, Hong Kong may not be the, the, the straightforward port for as is deliveries in the future. Hong, Singapore is still, uh, you know, where I'm based, Singapore is still very complicated. You have to get MPA approval 14 days in advance for a takeover here. Um, uh, and it seems that there's still very much a disconnect between the airlines and the local port authorities on where we can take take over vessels. You know, in the Far East, um, it, it's not clear at the moment at all. China, uh, Taiwan, Korea. Uh, the most straightforward place we had found was Hong Kong, but again, as I said, there has been a spike in cases there. So, I mean, I think you know, all, all we ask is for all parties to remain, you know, vigilant and cooperative, uh, and work together to 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 give safe, responsible quick uh, and creative solutions not only with the as is deliveries but also on delivered deals when 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 we encounter problems because um, it is an increasingly challenging environment and we haven't seen the last of this virus at all you can see india has uh, a spike in cases and certain cities will have to go into lockdown so yeah in summary this is the new environment i've had some interesting cases i think as as have we all over this period of time and uh, I think we're probably going to hand over to to the audience for any questions and see what comes up. All right. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Ferdon. Uh, thank you, Vagelis. Uh, I must admit, this is uh, kind of unique to all of us. This is the very first webinar, at least that I have participated. So, so pardon some of the the kind of the, the stiffness, not relating to the audience, not seeing them in the eye. Uh, the good news is we have a very we have a very strong participation. Uh, we have people from Japan, from from Korea, from all over the world, all the way from U.S., from South America, from Europe. So you have a very wide audience. We have almost 300 people who are on this on this webinar. I'm very pleased to advise that. Uh, and I have a tons of questions that are coming in. Uh, I'm trying to juggle several screens here, taking notes. So I must tell the audience, uh, please bear with us because I have about 50 questions in front of me. Obviously, we cannot answer these. Uh, we will try to answer some of them, respond to some of these to the panelists. Those who miss the answering, we do have an option of sending you the response privately. So we will respond to each one of these questions. So please don't hesitate to, to stay, to give your questions. We love hearing from you. That's how we respond you know, to the marketplace. Um, so before I start uh, asking questions, I just wanted to check with the panelists if they want to comment on anything that has been said so far. Uh, I know some of you may have even received comments <laughs> on your own WhatsApp messages. So if you want to choose to do that, uh, we can do that. Vagelis, I'm gonna start with you and then see if Fedon or if Jimmy wants to add to that. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I'm receiving a, a comment uh, in my WhatsApp, which I would like to address, basically. It's uh, one of the major uh, Greek components, and basically uh, he's uh, trying to understand how a force majeure is uh, uh, helping a seller. So I would like to give three examples that we faced uh, during this time to what I believe, and uh, that was really helpful for any supporter to have uh, this force majeure clause in the contract. Uh, I'll start with an easy one. One example was a vessel that had to arrive in one of the recycling countries and because of the COVID situation he was able to uh, declare force majeure and decide by himself not to arrive because of the uncertainty uh, that would be prevailing at that time and uh, Somebody can imagine basically with the incidents that have taken place, what would happen if the vessel had arrived because the seller would be obliged to arrive under the contract or would be default and would not have the option of cancelling uh, because of coronavirus. A second example, which again I think is remarkable, is uh, one of the capes that were stuck basically in one of the countries during the coronavirus. Uh, the vessel was stuck, no clearances was able to take place 
but eventually, especially because of the force majeure circumstances, it was possible to exploit a more positive chartering market by the time uh, that uh, the, the markets had uh, reopened again and the peso was able to, uh, was not obliged basically to be scrapped or to face a new reality uh, with um, uh, the prices that were prevailing uh, after uh, the cancellation had taken place. A third uh, example, which was really um, something that um, uh, was interesting to me and one of the best examples I had in good cooperation between the parties is basically uh, the vessel had already arrived again, like the instance of a cape, it was a container, and basically despite the fact that the formalities could not take place, which means that the seller is losing his cancellation, uh, he had the right to declare force majeure and working hand to hand we decided basically let's evaluate both routes at the same time. One being cancelling the deal because the vessel simply could not clear the formality so could not be delivered to any facility. That's just uh, the reality. And the second option we were kind of giving him the option of opportunity to either decide if he wants to proceed with recycling his unit once the market was open or would have to uh, or if he would choose to try and sell out and obtain again for clearance and exploit a better chartering market, which unfortunately was not the case for the container industry at that time. Uh, but I think these are three remarkable examples of how a uh, force majeure can turn out to be uh, positive uh, for a ship owner at that time. So, uh, thank you, Bagelis. I think if I may jump in. In, in principle, force majeure, I mean, uh, and that clause has been overused in the last three, four months, not just in the ship recycling, but in different you know, segments as well. In, in principle, you would think it is not something that benefits people who can take advantage of this clause. But we all have to appreciate what we are going through right now. I mean, certainly in, I have several gray hair in my lifetime. We have, and most of us in our lifetimes, we have not. It's not just a financial crisis. The closest comparison we can make is what we had in 2008, and that was a huge crisis, but it's a financial crisis. So once the governments pumped money into the, into the economy, I remember the markets fell all the way from $800 per ton to 220. And after a month, once you know traction started coming back, movement started happening in the marketplace, money came into the banking system. We, we came to a low of 220 and we started going up and we went all the way within a matter of few months from 220 to, to almost 350. We don't see it this time because this time, most of us are, are struggling to, to predict the future, to forecast. Uh, in this company, we have a weekly call where we try to understand where, which way the market is going to move in the next 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And you know what? I mean, we can only say, is the market going to remain the same? Is it going to fall or it's going to go up? Uh, and that's how we as cash bars are operating today. I mean, and none of us know for sure. And so we do our best. We try to take uh, certain calculated risks and then move on. So yes, it's not exactly the best thing to do. But in, in, if there was a case where force majeure did play well in some of these markets as this, and especially I know Cape owners, Cape owners took benefit of the rising freight market because when we were buying these Capes, the market was well below 5,000. And we started seeing this, of course, the market pretty much peak close to 30,000 and come back. So it gave at least them the options for the containers, especially the Panamax containers, they had to do what they have to do. And a lot of money was lost. And that has happened, not just in shipping, it has happened in other markets. A lot of money has been lost uh, due to this virus situation. I'm gonna try to move on to this, uh, some of the other questions that I see. Several questions have come in is on the EU situation, you know, because that is, uh, it is a hot topic. Um, several ships were sold recently into the EU ship recycling yards. As some of these ships were coming from the offshore industry, i.e. the drill ships, uh, some of the cruise ships, and news you saw in the press uh, made it uh, to the ship, uh, to the yards, mainly in Turkey. The question now is, are these yards full? I mean, you as traders sell in all these markets. So, Vagelis, when owners are coming to you and saying, I want to sell into a EU ship recycling yard, 
What is your answer? I mean, the reality is that basically if somebody is trying to comply with the regulation and at the same time uh, get the best value out of this, in reality the only option that he has, commercially speaking at least, is uh, Turkey with uh, uh, about six yards, if I'm not mistaken, that are approved uh, so far uh, and included in the European uh, Union uh, list of approved recycling facilities. Now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, today or yesterday I saw an article also in Tradewinds that basically is, uh, is addressing that uh, with the supply of ferries and cruise ships and uh, this part of the industry that is being uh, hit so hard from coronavirus, basically there are question marks if already the capacity is sufficient there. And uh, when we are talking about uh, two, three, five thousand lightweight, okay, maybe it's not a big issue because such a wet vessel can probably be absorbed uh, or recycled in a matter of a few, okay, I will not say weeks, but one or two months. But when we're talking about units of 30,000 lightweight or 20,000 lightweight, which are uh, big cruise ships that are hot, hot topic of discussion nowadays in most of the, the newsletters out there, I, I really doubt that uh, with uh, six facilities, basically this um, capacity uh, can absorb the supply of tonnage that has to be offered only from the particular industry of ferries and cruise ships there. So uh, an alternative, of course, is recycling facilities in Europe. I think we all know that, uh, or if somebody does a basic research, he can find out that if there are 40 yards there approved uh, and based in European Union, hardly, I mean, I don't know if 10%, if I say is too much of them actually doing recycling, I have in mind one or two yards only. There are The rest, as far as I'm concerned, are mostly repair yards. Um, and then we have one yard in the USA and that's about it. So the issue of capacity, no matter how uh, some uh, parties are trying uh, to avoid it, it is an issue and I think in the short term we're going to see the effect of this and uh, most likely owners will not be able to comply with the regulation even if they are willing to uh, without laying up their vessels and taking a ticket uh, to wait on the line for the facilities that are approved from EU. So the short answer is most likely if it's a large vessel, it's a big vessel, uh, a, a big cruise ship or a, or a tanker or a Panamax container, there probably is not an existing facility today. They may have to wait in queue for the facility to open up. The capacity is simply not there to do any of these major recycling. And this is the debate what we as cash buyers have been saying now for several years, EU does not have the capacity to uh, to recycle ships and Turkey is pretty much the only option we have. This is the, the thing we have said for a long time. Uh, regrettably, uh, you know, people didn't pay much attention. There was a lot of wrong information out there saying, yes, they do have the capacity. And the answer now is the capacity when owners are asking us, they don't have it. I know they've asked us, we have not been able to deliver it. And that becomes an interesting debate. Uh, what we are going to do is have a whole uh, next webinar devoted on this uh, EU ship recycling, uh, Hong Kong Convention, the differences, what happens in the yards, uh, Hong Kong Convention versus EU, and what's the main difference. So those of you have a lot of questions on this, please hang on to us. Give us another two weeks. Of course, we can reply to you by email, uh, but that's going to be another session on that. Uh, the other questions I see a lot of these that are coming on the screen even now is, is of course people want to know when we go back to $500 per ton or $600 per ton. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, I can tell you, it does seem like a mirage right now. Uh, at best, even if you go to 350, 400, I think that's going back to where we were uh, pre-COVID starting of this year, uh, you know, because we had uh, almost a 30% correction in values, always for markets fall easily coming, crawling back up is a slow process. A uh, lot of factors in play. That's why Vageli showed you the slides where the factors that affect is currency as well as steel markets. Uh, do we have a V-shape recovery or a U-shape recovery or a W-shape recovery or whichever shape you want? Uh, obviously this goes to all industry. It depends a lot by do we have going to have a vaccine and what are the implications? Will we suddenly have a situation where there is a lot of uh, you know, uh, positivity in the market? It could happen, it could happen. Why it could happen? Because there's, there's a lot of, you know, the, the monetary policies of governments, uh, there's unprecedented amount of money that is sitting uh, you know, in, in 
it's that's been pumped into this economy uh, and obviously you know that's going to drive some some growth whether it's infrastructure projects in the indian subcontinent or globally the demand for steel our demand is based on steel demand so can the prices increase yes they can um, pakistan is a good example uh, this was a market that pretty much was quiet for several years and just all of a sudden just started coming back in this market and now today it's the number one market in terms of pricing and several vessels have gone in there so you do have these very sudden and unexpected movements and uh, you know believe us it's it's tougher for us as cash buyers because we are the intermediaries we are taking actually the position on an asset uh, the good thing is that i think the worst is behind us i think we are all learning to cope with this i know in our company all all of us were working from home uh, and we managed to do reasonably well the flow the activities continued we didn't have to lay anybody off in fact we were hiring people uh, because the volumes the opportunities that came uh, were were stronger we were at the peak of COVID-19, we were busy buying. Uh, we, were, we had delivered the vessels under tow. Uh, and so that part of the business kept on going. So as, as Fedon said, our job is to keep on finding solutions. And Jamie gave an illustration saying, there are going to be challenges, but if we all have confidence in each other and saying, okay, I think this is making sense. Uh, you guys are all intelligent people then saying, okay, I think I, I can recognize that. Then we have found, and we are really thankful. As I said, we can't take credit for that. We are just showing up with all these options in front of the owners and owners say, I like this, I don't like this. And the idea is how do we get it done? And I must also thank the shipyards. They work really hard. It's not easy for them to have this inventory sitting in these yards and no workers. Getting these workers back because in India and in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, you do have a lot of migrant workers. And so when COVID happened, yes, there was lockdown. As soon as uh, this lockdown moved out, workers started going back to their to their villages, to their to their uh, home vill towns and villages, and they're gradually coming back up. Uh, and I think it was admirable. And maybe to some extent, 2008 help people build up this kind of reserves and plan for these black swan events uh, in this. So I, I mean, pretty much running out of time. Um, as I said, we only took two questions out of, out of more than 50 here. Uh, what I want to say is we will answer these questions. Uh, but I want to close by saying that if we can, is, is the business open? Yes, the business is open. Is recycling happening? Yes. What kind of ships are coming? We started with a lot of capes, a lot of containers, a lot of VLOCs, primarily the dry bulk. Uh, then came all the containers, a lot of car carriers, a lot of Roros. Uh, and so it depends, not too many tankers, a lot of, lot of vessels from the offshore sectors, FPSOs, uh, FSUs. Um, when will the tankers come in? Uh, expectations were maybe by Q4. Uh, will it happen by Q4? Some people say Q, uh, Q1, uh, 2021 of next year. But one thing I must tell you, even if the supply comes in, we have been through enough of these, uh, we have been in business for more than two decades. Oh, there will be thousands of ships, there will be, you know, people will have to pay and prices will fall. Yeah, prices do move, like we are in the commodity business. But it's not like suddenly the skies are going to open up. Uh, if we come through this, okay, I mean, the, the, the fear is we might be going through phase two of this. Uh, Jamie mentioned things coming back. Uh, we, we are taking delivery this week and people were about to fly and suddenly Hong Kong took strict measures. There is, by the way, disconnect because we take over a lot of ships. What we sign in the press where 10 countries said we are ready to help with crew change. It's not easy because there's a disconnect between the airlines as well as the uh, uh, the airports and then getting into into the, the cities. But fortunately, Hong Kong has been uh, very open about it. Uh, Singapore is still not as easy. That's pretty much, we always consistently follow daily news to see what's a port where we can take delivery of ourselves. Of course, the best option in the short term 
is to for the sellers to deliver their ships uh, to the recycling yards because all three of these Indian subcontinent countries are open. Uh, there are select flights that allow uh, you, uh, the crew to be repatriated. So once again, thank you all very, very much uh, for participating in this. Uh, we're gonna do a little poll. Any suggestions you have, what sessions we're gonna do, we're gonna try to do it. We're gonna try to keep it short unless we feel there's a need to expand. So we just, our objective is simply to communicate with you guys of what's happening with the industry. So you get information straight from people who are putting the real money on the table are doing day-to-day -day deals and rather than somebody who might be sitting several thousand miles away and, and making some calls. So keep your questions uh, coming and thank you again for participating in there. Thank you, Jamie, Fedon, Magalis for all this. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.